Welcome, everyone. My name is Kurt Langlott, director of the Amy Center, and we're delighted to have you all here today for our Amy uh, speakers. And we're especially delighted to have this amazing audience in the room today. It's crowded in here. <laughs> it's great. Um, so thanks all for being here. Uh, today, we're delighted to have David Kim and Julia Reisler yes. here with us. Uh, David is an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Stanford, uh, who does research focusing on predicting short and long-term trajectories of ED patients using multimodal modeling of physiologic, clinical, and administrative data. And uh, Julia is a master's student in CS here at Stanford. Before she was here, she was a machine learning engineer at Apple, where she specialized in active learning and distribution shifts. And they were here today to talk to us about augmenting physician capabilities with AI-powered patient modeling in the emergency department. So, David and Julia, take it from here. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you very and much. And feel free to introduce yourself further if you wish. I think that uh, I think that captures it. Okay, uh, good. So I'll uh, just get started here. Um, the ED is uh, the most clinically diverse and informationally dense environment in healthcare. Um, this is a schematic of a typical ED visit. Um, it's very common that in the ED, a patient will undergo more diagnostic testing, therapeutic interventions, and monitoring in the span of a few hours than they might otherwise experience in a year or more in healthcare. Um, this data is inherently multimodal. In this illustration, you can see that a patient comes into the hospital, they enter triage, that produces a mixture of structured and unstructured information about the reason for their visit. They're placed in a room connected to a physiologic monitor that records things like their vital signs, namely heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, temperature, physiologic waveforms like the electrocardiogram, the photoplethysmogram. Um, the clinician places uh, orders for uh, medications, uh, IV fluids uh, that are reflected responses to those data. Uh, orders are placed for lab tests and uh, imaging studies whose results um, become available at various points in the visit, and then in turn, uh, feedback to produce more clinical decisions and associated monitoring responses. Um, ultimately, this culminates in uh, a decision about the disposition of the patient, meaning do they go home, are they admitted to the hospital, to what service, to what level of care. Um, so we can see that this, uh, this data is inherently multimodal. Um, that means that you know, it's coming from different sources. It's also um, stored or not stored uh, in various ways. Uh, it becomes available at, uh, at different times. Some of the features can be considered relatively static or stable uh, throughout the visit, like the patient's medical history and um, uh, reason for their visit. And uh, some are time varying over the scale of minutes or hours, like serial lab tests. And some are time varying over the scale of milliseconds, like um, cardiogram uh, or the physiological waveform. Uh, by almost any estimate, there are orders of magnitude more data produced in healthcare in general and maybe the ED in particular than are actually stored in the electronic healthcare record, uh, and therefore accessible for clinical decision making. This is um, an example of uh, vital signs alone, which is just a, a small fraction of the total data. Um, vital sign monitoring is one of the fundamental tasks of emergency medicine and critical care. Um, and they're called you know, vital signs for a reason. It's very well known that uh, abnormalities and changes in vital signs over the course of um, days or hours or sometimes minutes can have real diagnostic and therapeutic and prognostic significance. And as I mentioned, patients are connected to monitors that are recording these features at uh, a very high resolution. Um, but only a tiny fraction of those vital signs are actually uh, reported in the health record and are therefore uh, useful for, for clinical decisions. So uh, does this matter? Um, this is um, a depiction of two ED visits that were monitored at relatively high frequency. Uh, this is uh, four vital signs, the heart rate, mean arterial, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation. Uh, and these black points are the values that are recorded by uh, ED patients and therefore reflected in the health record. Um, these red dots are the values that are uh, actually captured by the monitor. And you can see uh, here in this first example that um, the black dots, meaning the, the nursing reported observations that enter the medical record, actually provide a very good description of the patient's physiology as it evolves over the course of this visit. Uh, whereas in this example, this is a, a visit, a triage of the same acuity level, same nursing ratios, approximately the same number of total observations. Um, 
the nursing reported vital signs provide a forfeit to the patient's actual physiology, uh, in this case, the patient's uh, developing uh, hypotension and, and septic shock. So uh, we wanted to know, you know, what would be entailed in making the second case look more like the, the first one and what that would uh, mean potentially for clinical care in the ED. Uh, and we developed a series of strategies, um, prospectively, uh, to establish monitoring schedules whereby um, nurses would check on patients and record vital signs. We compare this to actual practice and to the optimal placement of observations to provide the, the best fit to a patient's actual physiology for a given number of observations. And the upshot of this is that we found that you know, relatively simple rules um, whereby we uh, observe patients more frequently if their last vital signs were abnormal and less frequently if they were stable can provide a close to optimal description of the patient's uh, physiology for a given number of observations. That's optimal is purple here, and um, this simple perspective rule where we observe patients every 40 minutes if they're unstable and 80 minutes if they're unstable um, turns out to be you know, the second best. Uh, and more importantly, um, these sorts of strategies we found can reduce the time lag in detecting important um, actionable abnormalities like low blood pressure, faster or low heart rate, or low oxygen saturation. Uh, but this was all um, descriptive, and uh, we wanted to next see whether we could uh, whether we could predict these um, these incipient abnormalities and, and how well. And this is uh, something that happens uh, every day. A patient will enter the emergency department uh, looking basically well with grossly normal vital signs, and within a couple of hours, will uh, get sick and sometimes need um, you know, resuscitation or uh, critical care level interventions. Um, and here we're just again, focusing on this one patient, initially normal blood pressure. They become you know, hypotensive uh, an hour and a half later. Um, this is a, a recent paper in which we tried to predict these decompensation events in these initially stable patients. Uh, so here we're um, looking at patients who come into the ED. Most of these patients you know, walk into the lobby with uh, normal vital signs. We collect their um, triage information, the reason for their visit, basic demographic information. And then uh, when they're roomed, we um, use the first several minutes of monitoring to uh, extract their uh, vital signs from the uh, high resolution uh, monitoring. Um, we model those trends. We capture the ECG and PPG waveforms from which we extract other features like their heart rate variability, the pulse transit time, which uh, provides a continuous estimation of uh, blood pressure, measures of peripheral perfusion. And then finally, we produce uh, embeddings of the ECG and PPG waveforms themselves using uh, transformers. And we um, feed all of these features into a classifier to predict which of these initially stable patients are going to develop tachycardia or hypertension or hypoxia in the next 90 minutes. Um, and we find uh, in each of these cases that uh, incorporating the data from this brief monitoring period substantially improves um, the predictions of these uh, abnormalities in initially stable patients. Um, we find, moreover, that um, they use a variety of different types of features to make these predictions, namely you know, the information at triage, but also vital sign trends, the secondary characteristics that we extract from those trends, like uh, heart rate variability, fusion <coughs> index, and, um, and the, in some cases, like uh, in predicting uh, tachycardia and other arrhythmias, the uh, ECG the waveforms themselves. Um, and we're, uh, we're finding in other work that there's um, there's substantial information in these continuously collected waveforms, um, sometimes comparable, sometimes superior to um, conventional representations of the same physiology, um, for instance, the electrocardiogram. This is a, an example where we looked at you know, several thousand patients who come into the ED complaining of chest pain or shortness of breath. Uh, one of the questions um, each physician always wants to answer in that situation is, is this, uh, is this a heart attack, is this myocardial injury? Uh, we look at um, the electrocardiogram waveform collected continuously before patients have a troponin result, and this is uh, this is very uh, messy and artifactual data compared to the 12 to 10 second electrocardiogram. But there's uh, a lot of it, and we want to see you know can we extract um, information from the fact that we're uh, observing these trends over time rather than high resolution snapshot. For those without a medical background, can you explain troponin? Uh, yes, so uh, troponin is um, a cardiac enzyme uh, whose level um, indicates whether there's injury to the, the heart muscle and therefore you know, whether a patient with, uh, with chest pain plausibly has a, a cardiac reason for that. Um, in some cases, that can, uh, that can be what's conventionally considered a heart attack, like a blocked coronary artery. In some cases, it's a little more, uh, little more subtle. But in, in any case, uh, an elevated troponin in a patient with, with chest pain is for all intents and purposes, considered uh, you know a myocardial injury, which is uh, something that we want to know about. 
mechanism. Um, and we looked at this in a of course. Could you describe the dimensionality of the ECG data that you're talking about? What's the sampling frequency? What the time course of the signal typically is? Just so we get a scale of the data. Of course, yes. So um, in this, um, the sampling frequency is um, I think 500 hertz that we down sampled in this paper to uh, I think 128 to match the uh, PPG. Um, it's collected. Variously, the, the typical EE visit is a few hours. Uh, patients will be on and off the monitor. Um, they're initially placed on the, the monitor. Leads get you know detached if the patient goes to the bathroom, goes to radiology. So it's it's uh, you know as I said, it's intermittent and artifactual. Some patients have you know, minutes of good quality monitoring. Some patients have hours. Um, in this instance, we are sampling uh, ten uh, segments that we're using to make these predictions. Ten segments of the ECG from before their first two months. Can uh, what's the, like, what's a what's a segment? Uh, a segment here is also uh, is, is 15 seconds, it's 10, 15 seconds. Thank you. Um, How is that data nominally stored? Is it stored on the device? Is it pushed somewhere or is it not stored? Uh, that's a great question and we're getting to that. But so historically not stored. Uh, so historically uh, the monitor data is um, essentially discarded. As I mentioned, um, a nurse will write down the vital signs periodically. For some um, high duty patients that I want to monitor closely, I will be Standing in the room, you know, looking at the monitor while, uh, you know, while assessing an in intervention. But for the most part, that, that data just uh, that goes away. Um, two and a half years ago, we start Stanford started actually uh, storing this data, and that's when we got interested in you know, what what could we actually do with this? Can we uh, can we make this useful? But, um, but that's that's a rarity, and, and uh, most institutions uh, will just discard this data. So uh, this ECG is just a monitor, one regulation, or is it uh, an actual ECG with all the regulations? Uh, so here we're just using a single lead, since lead two is the most uh, reliably collected in all these patients. Um, it, uh, it's very variable. It depends how many electrodes the patient has on at the time. Uh, so some patients who are uh, closely monitored for you know, cardiac evaluation will have several continuous leads. Um, only a few, uh, and here just as for purposes of demonstration, we want to see what we can do with just you know single continuous. You want just one? Yes, yeah, we do. Um, but the the upshot here is that um, in making these predictions, uh, lead to alone sampled multiple times over uh, uh, prior to the troponin result um, could actually predict myocardial injury at least as well as um, analogous methods applied to the uh, the twelve lead electrocardiogram. Um, and what was interesting to us about this finding is that um, this is a this is a messy, continuous, voluminous signal of the kind that's increasingly going to be available from uh, from wearable devices, and that you know, doesn't even need to be obtained in hospital. So we can imagine you know, using this sort of thing for for screening in, uh, in pre-hospital settings, even from uh, you know, consumer wearables. Um, but the uh, the issue with all of these models uh, and all these findings is that we can't actually do any of this in practice because, uh, as I mentioned. Um, in many cases, the data are not stored, and even in our case, when um, when they are, they're not uh, stored in such a way as to be accessible to the clinician uh, for, for decision making. Um, and as a result, we end up using a lot of this data uh, reactively, uh, monitoring this very non-personalized. Most alarms are considered uh, nuisances. Um, the um, the data, as I mentioned, is uh, is inherently multimodal, and much of the information can only be captured in a multimodal um, conception of the data. But those uh, modalities are uh, are siloed, and as a result, the clinician, even if she wants to, can't uh, effectively you know, search across these modalities to find the relevant information. And there are analogous uh, problems for uh, for research on this data. Uh, so at this point, I uh, want to introduce my uh, collaborator, Julia Reisler, who's going to be talking about some of our ongoing work to try to solve some of these problems. Great. Um, so to address a lot of these pain points that uh, David brought up in the last slide, we're building out a software called PhysioHub. The goal of PhysioHub is we would like to empower uh, physicians in the emergency department and ICU to be able to practice more personalized care. Uh, in the context of the ED and ICU, uh, this means being able to effectively use data that spans uh, multiple modalities to be able to use to be able to uh, connect both the short-term and the long-term dependencies of this data. 
So a couple of things that we're building into PhysioHub. So one, we're going to make it uh, a lot easier for physicians to uh, search across uh, historical trends from a patient. So they'll be able to not only see the vital signs, but um, annotations about the medications that were administered and how a patient reacted to those from both the current vi uh, visit and from previous visits. They'll also be able to compare their patients' uh, current trends to patients who are in similar uh, cohorts. We want to reduce the alarm fatigue problem as well. So uh, what we're planning here is uh, to allow physicians to create uh, personalized al alarms for their or customizable alarms for their patients. Um, we want to be able to create these alarms that are based on whether a patient deviates from uh, their baseline. Uh, rather than just goes above some static threshold. And furthermore, um, what we're going to have in PhysioHub as well is these uh, continuous um, machine learning models that are making predictions on uh, the patient's data. Uh, these will be uh, the models that we've been building out um, that will be clinically driven. So uh, on the next slide, we'll talk about some of this. Uh, so again, uh, right now, we're building out the models that are going to power PhysioHub. A lot of the models that David uh, previously talked about, they sort of use these single modalities of data. For example, you know, if you're trying to predict myocardial injury, uh, looking at uh, the, the ECG um, is you know, uh, the way to go here. Um, what we're trying to build out are these sorts of models and approach these prediction problems that require forming this more general representation of a patient's visit. Um, and so they use dependencies across different modalities of data. Um, so we'll talk about the first case on the next slide. So uh, the first modeling problem that, we've, that we're, we are going to talk about here is an emergency department's uh, disposition prediction problem. So uh, disposition, that's uh, essentially where the patient uh, should go after they've uh, been in the emergency department. So at a high level, the physician decides whether this patient should be admitted to the hospital uh, or discharged from the hospital. At a more granular level, this can include categories such as the patient going to the ICU, going to inpatient, going to uh, observation, for example. Now, for a lot of this, this is a very good contender for this uh, multi multimodality problem because um, while there are some cases where it may be clear to a doctor from a single modality, like a critical lab results, uh, that, you know, this is where a patient should go. There are a lot of less uh, cut and dry cases. So, for example, a doctor may um, decide to do an inter intervention for the patient, and then looking at the response and the vital signs um, is how a doctor makes this final decision. Uh, so that cuts across several different modalities. Um, and furthermore, what we're trying to do here is to not just make static uh, predictions at a single time point, but we want to build a model that can continuously predict throughout a patient's visit. We think that this would be helpful for uh, hospital logistics reasons. So um, what one thing hospital administrators have to do is they have to uh, you know, deal with capacity issues and allocating beds to different parts of the hospital. We think that this could be a useful tool there in terms of making that more efficient. Um, just the ED disposition prediction alone, uh, we don't think that's going to be like particularly uh, used per se by a physician. It's not gonna change their minds, but in a couple of slides, I'll also talk more about how we're extending this work to make it more clinically useful for a doctor. For some of that data, how much of it has it? Like I'm assuming particularly if you're doing fine grain, analyses over time, yeah. how, how much of it can be captured like at this exact same time um, versus needing maybe having lags from someone inputting something or needing to sync data in some way? Uh, well, that, that, that's a good question. So um, our, our goal, uh, what we're working with research IT to do is to be able to get everything um, up to the last few minutes, which seems to be feasible. We think we can probably you know, push that even further, but for most of the applications that we envision, that's um, that that's captures you know, everything that I have put on it. Searching everything on the little bedside, card that's doing like SQ2, et cetera, is kind of live going and that's not going to chart as well, or more this is just physiologic. So it, it's the combination of, of the two. So that again, the um, 
the biggest limitation right now is that the, um, the physiologic monitoring is what's giving context for everything else that happens. Uh, so, you know, a, a lab result uh, occurs, uh, you know, a patient is, is anemic, but, you know, the, the meaning of that uh, depends totally on how, how they're uh, responding to what it actually is that in a lab duration. Likewise, you know, if you give a medication, what that actually signifies for the patient depends on, on how they respond to it. Um, so right now, the only way we can get that context is by, uh, you know, being in the room and, and you know, and watching this happen and, and assembling a clinical gestalt. Um, our goal is to basically, you know, make those data available simultaneously, so um, we can we can use the uh, the physiological monitoring as context for these these clinical events. Um, you know, with with a, a lag of we think a couple of minutes, well, lags, whatever it takes for human to do. Well, and then the, sorry, go ahead. Um, I noticed the previous example was directly using this data to predict an output. Do you guys think there's any value in like somehow embedding this data ahead of time just to represent the signal as it goes? So like like our generative type models, or maybe that's something you've already tried. Um, so so yes, and, and I think you know Julia's going to get to uh, to some of that. Um, but uh, that, that's actually one of the points on which we would you know love your input is uh, you know strategies to produce um, a generally useful representation of, of this data um, because again you know as as we mentioned, part of what makes the data unique is that um, the, um, the, the the patient is only really comprehensible with respect to you know different modalities, but also um, temporal relationships among those modalities of, of different uh, different kinds, and um, how best to uh, how best to represent that uh, for you know making a variety of uh, predictions and diagnoses. So that's an open question. Then. Is that a question about what you were just uh, discussing? Predicting who would be admitted versus discharged. Right. How is that different than recommending that this patient be admitted or discharged, which would be potentially quite useful? Is it the same thing, or uh, so it, it's a, it's a, slightly different. So um, again, really, what we'd like to know um, is what the optimal disposition is for the patient. Yeah. Um, so we that that's um, that that data that label doesn't. Exist exactly, uh, but we can do things like you know look at among patients who were admitted to the floor, which ones end up in the ICU within the next day. That's one of our um, you know, focuses of research. We detect those patterns that signal that that the misdisposition of the patient ought to have gone to the ICU instead of the ward, or you know patient who's sent home but then comes back later that day with you know the same problem. Um, that you know we, we might predict that patient would be discharged based on clinician behavior, but really it it, it ought to have been an admission. So. Uh, so that, that's how we're trying to get at. Um, so prediction is, is not as good because you're predicting human behavior, which necessarily might have yeah, you know, basically not it's... make an optimal decision. Mm -hmm. I see. So you're trying to come up with other ground truth measures that would, you could test against. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Got it. Great. Uh, any more questions? Awesome. I'll move on. Um, so basically, as uh, David talked a little bit about earlier, um, we have this data set that was collected over the past two and a half years from Stanford's emergency department. Uh, this is sort of a first of its kind data set in terms of all the different modalities of data that we have. We have not only like the continuous vitals, we have data available at triage, uh, the orders, the results, et cetera. Um, we have data from a total of over 120,000 different patient visits. Um, and then furthermore, uh, we are approaching this problem as both, you know, the binary prediction of uh, discharge versus admit. Uh, that's uh, done a, a lot in literature in this topic, so it makes it, you know, easier for us to compare against that. And then we're also doing this uh, at a more granular, multi-class level of uh, discharge uh, observation in patient ICU. Um, but one thing to just notice about this is our data is highly imbalanced. So we have. Uh, you know, many, many times more uh, data from patients who are discharged than uh, who go to the ICU, for example. So we'll talk a little bit more about the data on the next slide. Julia, one question about that slide. If you... Sure, go ahead. For the test set, is, is it 72,000 unique patients? Or is that? Oh, I'm sorry, that's that's an error. So I, um, so maybe that should be like 7,000. 7, oh, okay. yeah. 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 Sorry, I don't so know. So we're the ratio of the visits to patients <laughs> and it didn't seem to match. No, no you're, you're totally yeah. right. Yeah. So the, the test set here, we broke it into it's 10% of the total data set. Right. So that, that should be on the order of like 7,000, 7, not 72,000. Yeah. 7,210. 
and 0.3 efficient. <laughs> <laughs> That's one point error. Um, so going more specifically into the different uh, types of data that we have, so we've really sort of broken it down into four different kinds. Uh, the first kind is the data that's available from the patient at triage. Um, so this contains both discrete and numeric type data. So for the discrete data, for example, that'll be things like uh, their chief complaints, their sex. Uh, for this, we do a simple like one hot encoding. Uh, there's also numeric data like you know the age, the vital signs at triage, uh, those get scaled down to the zero one range. Uh, the next type of data we have are the different orders. So these can be things like you know orders for imaging studies, medications, nursing communications, uh, lab tests. Um, and so what we do here is we actually use a word to vec embedding for these orders. So orders that occur frequently together in a single visit in our training set will be embedded in what will be very close together in this embedding space. Uh, the next thing we have are we have uh, actual lab results. We're sort of using high level features from this. So we simply use signal of whether um, the lab result came back normal, which gets mapped to one, uh, abnormal, low or high, mapped to two, uh, critical, high or low, that gets mapped to three. And then finally, we have our continuous vital signs. Uh, so these are, you know, the, the physiological monitoring David was talking about that come uh, off of the Philips monitor um, and are sort of, you know, uh, throughout the patient visit, except for, you know, some of the cases David talked about where the patient goes to the bathroom, et cetera. Uh, what we do here is we, you know, apply AZ score normalization. So uh, everything is sort of normalized to the, the mean is zero, standard deviation of one. Um, We've tried a couple of different models to approach this problem so far. So the first one is we've tried some uh, more, more simple models. So uh, logistic regression, uh, a gradient boosted decision tree using the LGBM package. Uh, one thing to note about those is that uh, they're not, the structure of the models are not really made to handle these like time varying features. And so for those, we, we didn't integrate like, the continuous vital signs and we sort of use the data at triage orders, lab results uh, as sort of static features. Um, the other approach that we have tried as well is a, a neural network uh, using an LSTM. So for this, we take the static features, we apply a couple of feed forward layers, uh, take the continuous vital signs, apply uh, the LSTM, and then we sort of combine these in a late fusion approach before making the prediction. Um, now, one thing to note is we're not extracting a lot of signal out of the continuous vital signs in this case. We actually have found that uh, the gradient boosted decision tree up to this point is performing better than that model. Um, and so this sort of motivates some of our next steps, which I'll talk about on the next slide, uh, which we're going to try a transformer approach to better capture some of these signals. So. Going a little bit deeper into the performance results from uh, the gradient boosted decision tree, one thing we can see is the best model performance comes from uh, using data from these different sources. So we have our best model performance when we use not only the data at triage, but the orders and the lab results as well. Um, we can sort of compare this to the data that's available for the patient towards the beginning of the, the visit, the data at triage. Um, and we see a pretty significant lift. Now, this really motivates um, the continuous sort of predictions that we're trying to do, because uh, clearly there are some patients where the model is able to perform much better after seeing uh, their orders and their lab results. Um, so the, the big next step that we're planning to do here is that uh, we're gonna use a transformer architecture which will better enable us to use these uh, time varying features and really uh, capture short and long range dependencies between these. Um, and we're hoping that this will allow us to extract uh, more signal out of these continuous vital signs. Uh, next slide, please. Question. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so that, sorry. one way to look at that data is to say that the, the orders are a reflection of the clinician's opinion and that that's a very valuable piece of data. Right, because it seems like that's where you're doing very well is when the orders are included in your model. Yes, yeah. exactly. Is that the way you, what you would conclude? Yeah, yeah that's, okay. that's, that's sort of my hypothesis about what's going on. Uh, I mean, I think that probably makes sense from the medical perspective as well. Right, so I mean, in, in the extreme case, um, at some point the 
physician places a, a disposition order, uh, right. which, is, uh, you know, which is definitive. Um, we, you know, we're excluding things that you know just give away the uh, the answer in that way. But uh, but yes, we I think the the reason there's a lot of signal in the orders. Um, they're uh, they're sort of a, a summary of as you say the clinicians thinking about you know everything that's that's going on in their you know the area, not just you know what's ordered, but the you know the, the speed at which things are ordered, how many things are ordered up front, um, whether orders are uh, are entered in response to uh, to findings uh, that that come up is you know a, a signal of you know how dynamic the, the patient is. And, you know, So I keep asking about the dimensionality of your inputs, but could you talk more about what is actually in the orders? You know, how many orders are there? Because at least in our experience, uh, when we've tried to look at some unstructured data like free text, if our number of tokens are very small, mm -hmm. some of these self-retention methods actually get beaten by word to back, uh, hands down. So I feel like there's probably some critical point where changing your architecture is beneficial, but I guess it's a function of how big your inputs are. So just curious to see what's included in the orders. Um, so th there are thousands of dis discrete types of orders that are placed in the ED. I think in this model, Julia, you can tell us exactly we're using. We're allowing seven hundred different for, orders. For this one, we are allowing like uh, over a thousand. Yeah. Okay. okay. So it is. It is pretty high. Okay. And each order is. Is it the text description of that order that's in the system that you're using? So it's, it's the the procedure name. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's the um, procedure description out of Epic, essentially. Right. Uh, but but the but the um, the the words of embeddings are produced not based on the text, but mm -hmm. um, but treating the orders um, themselves as as tokens. Yes. As, you know, as okay. Tokens. Right. Right. So it's based oh, on so you know if, if these orders frequently appear with you know another order um, in the training set in like the oh. same visit, uh, then they'll be close together in this space. Oh, I thought you were tokenizing the actual text. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's more single there. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Uh, great. Yeah. So we can move on. All right. So um, I talked a little bit earlier about how we are extending this work uh, to make it more clinically useful for physicians. Um, the way we are planning to do this is by having a recommender system for uh, diagnostic testing pathways. Um, we think that uh, basically if we can recommend, you know, tests that are likely to be dispositive uh, earlier in the visit, uh, we can significantly reduce the amount of time that patients have to spend in the emergency departments. Um, and one thing to note here is, you know, in terms of the amount of time patients are spending, um, the average time is over four hours. The biggest bottleneck here is uh, waiting for, you know, the orders and the order results. Um, when people have to spend more time in the emergency department, that means other people have to spend more time in the waiting room. Um, and we've seen in previous studies that the amount of time people are having to spend waiting um, does have you know, an effect on mortality rates in the hospital. So if we can reduce this time, we can potentially save people's lives. Uh, so we'll go on to the next slide. So when we think about what we would like to have in this order recommender system, there are three overarching aspects. So the first one is, uh, which we, we just talked about, is uh, we want to look at orders that take a long time to result. Um, so for example, in our training data, you know, when we see orders where uh, it's placed and it takes several hours uh, until we, we get the result for that order, um, we want to recommend those earlier in the visit. The second uh, aspect that we want our recommender system to have is we want these orders to be uh, dispositive. So these should be um, you know, diagnostic tests where uh, a doctor looks at this and it significantly influences their decision of uh, where the patient should go. There's sort of two methods that we're using right now to try to approach this problem. The first is sort of looking at our training set. If we see an order result came back um, you know, very close to the time the doctor made the disposition. Uh, our hypothesis is that that is potentially a dispositive order. Uh, the other thing that we are planning to do is sort of using our emergency department disposition model that I previously talked about. Um, we're going to try to identify the orders that uh, in expectation uh, change the uh, prediction from this model most significantly. Um, an extension to this is we also want to try to 
uh, alert a physician to whether a patient is likely to get a critical result uh, from that potential order uh, based on you know, the phenotypes of the patient's visit. Um, and then the third aspect we want to incorporate is we need to make sure that our recommender system is uh, suggesting orders that actually make sense uh, with the phenotype of the patient's visit. So one example uh, would be, you know, if a patient comes in with abdominal pain, um, a, in a common order for this would be, you know, a CT scan with contrast. However, if a patient has an allergy to that contrast, uh, we want our recommender system to not recommend, uh, you know, that, that particular uh, diagnostic testing pathway. Um, and so for this, we are using a modeling approach, which I'll talk more about in the next slide. There's a question from Daniel. Okay. Um, he's raised his hand. I'm not a card question. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are now. Go ahead. Thank you. My major concern, as you probably know, there was a recent uh, major analysis that claimed 25% of ED uh, diagnoses were wrong. So I don't want to get into what the real number is, but shouldn't the endpoint of your studies be the validity of the decision? N not that they made a decision to send them home or to uh, admit to ICU, but down the line, not the right decision. Shouldn't all these algorithms be uh, dictated by the correctness of the decision? Uh, yes, thank you. So, um, you know, as, as you can imagine, there's there's a lot of uh, controversy about that um, uh, that finding in emergency medicine, and I'm I'm uh, skeptical of that myself. But um, what what Julie was getting at with respect to uh, order recommendation um, is, you know, for as we mentioned earlier, with respect to disposition, there's the descriptive aspect that captures existing behavior um, in which the, the model is going to be influenced by what um, what a physician is likely to do in, in this scenario. But uh, we're trying to balance that with um, with as, as close as to you know ground truth as we can get on significant significant findings, um, which is the other the, as the other aspect of the recommendation system. Meaning, um, what is the likelihood that um, this this test that's being recommended is going to uh, yield an actionable result, um, and what, what we're aiming to do there is basically to uh, to improve the the reasoning process that uh, that's already practiced in medicine, whereby you know I'm thinking about ordering a test, and I have some idea from the literature of what the uh, you know what the pretest probability uh, is for a given uh, diagnostic maneuver, um, and uh, our our thought is you know we we can do better than uh, than, than just that because we've observed enough instances that we can phenotype patients and say, you know, with, with more accuracy, what's the likelihood that, uh, that this, uh, this imaging study or, or lab result is going to um, yield a, a meaningful finding. Um, so that's, uh, in, you know, in, in all of these cases, we're, uh, we're cognizant of the fact that uh, ex existing practice, uh, which, uh, which we're using as inputs, you know, throughout is, um, is flawed, whether, you know, whether that number is, is 25% or, uh, or something else. Um, there are instances where we can uh, modulate that with, uh, with with gold standard uh, labels. In some cases, it's more uh, more clear cut than others. You know, my concern is you may be optimizing uh, more rapid wrong diagnoses. If you're not doing anything to monitor the end result of the truth, then your optimization uh, may be great if they speed up process through the emergency department, which is good but it may not improve outcomes. Uh, yes, so that, that's that's the risk. And you know, as, as I mentioned, that's why you know, in predicting disposition, we wanna, we're looking at not just you know, where the patient uh, empirically goes, but, um, but ideally recommending uh, a disposition that as far as we can tell is appropriate, meaning that if the patient is sent home, they don't come back three days later with the, with the same problem or worse than the patient's admitted to uh, you know, medicine ward. They don't, uh, you know, escalate to the ICU because their uh, their level of severity was underestimated. Well, unless you're um, following them completely, they may go to another facility. Uh, yes, that's right. There, there are going to, some of the significant outcomes we're not uh, we're not going to be able to observe. That's um, that's true. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, then we'll move on.
Um, so again, this third aspect that we talked about from the previous slide, we are approaching this, um, you know, with, with the modeling approach. Uh, really, what we're looking for here is if people have suggestions on uh, the approaches we're using, that would be very helpful to us. Now, uh, just to sort of get quick and easy results, we initially approached this using a gradient boosted decision tree model. So essentially what we did is we took the data uh, about a patient's visit, we took the uh, word to vec order, concatenate those, pass it into the tree, and then predict you know, between zero and one whether uh, that order should be recommended to the patient. Um, we were also using this uh, sort of negative, hard negative mining approach for uh, negative sampling. Uh, the reason here is uh, if we sort of think about the, the space of uh, negative samples, it's very large. Um, for a patient visit, a doctor will uh, sort of, I guess, order maybe uh, 10 to 20 different orders. Um, in terms of the space that we talked about for the results, you know, uh, we've, for this problem, scaled it down to like 700, but um, this, the, the total space is like thousands of different possible orders. Um, and so what we do with hard negative mining is instead of just randomly sampling the space, uh, what we do is we first train our model, you know, I guess using like a smaller random sample from the space. Uh, then what we do is we use the model to run inference uh, on a bunch of uh, different negative samples. We look to see uh, what are the negative samples where the model is performing the worst, where it's misclassifying, uh, and we add these to the training set. Then we train the model again uh, and keep repeating this process over many epochs. Um, now, you know, initially when we eyeball the results from the gradient boosted decision tree, uh, they, they look okay, but we are trying to do better. So our next step is to try an embedding based model approach. Uh, basically what we would do here is we would essentially have two different encoders. Uh, the first encoder, uh, or I guess each encoder would, um, or one encoder would operate on the patient data, the other would operate on the orders, it would map those to a shared embedding space. Um, and then what it does after that is it calculates the cosine similarity between the patient and the order, uh, recommending orders that have a high cosine similarity uh, with the representation of the patient. Um, we've also decided to, to change our primary metric to recall at K. Uh, this more closely captures, you know, the sort of task that we are trying to do in the emergency department. Um, and, you know, for a similar reason, we are also changing our loss function. Um, so one issue with binary loss is it doesn't provide this sort of personalized metric that we are really looking for. Uh, with binary loss, it pushes the predictions in such a way that uh, the negative uh, samples should be predicted higher than the positive, than, or sorry, the positive samples should be predicted higher than the negative samples. Um, it does not take into account anything about the patient visit and it over uh, penalizes the model. <clears throat> so even if the model has a perfect recall at K metric, um, it may still have a high loss value in this case. What Bayesian personalized ranking does instead is it looks for specific patient visits. Uh, are the positive samples ranked higher than the negative samples? So again, this goes back to this uh, personalization approach that uh, we're trying to do with this uh, recommender system and with uh, PhysioHub that we're building out. Now, uh, the, the last sort of change that we're planning to make uh, is with regards to our negative sampling. So, um, again, we're not doing random sampling because what happens here is this leads to a bunch of just uh, easy and uninformative samples. Um, but the, on the opposite side, the problem with hard negative sampling is that this can actually lead to model collapse. Um, and so there's another uh, type of strategy called distance weighted sampling. Um, and this has been shown both empirically and theoretically. Uh, to perform better than those two approaches and uh, sort of uh, solves those, both of those issues. Um, so can we go to the next slide, please? Great. Um, so the next topic that we are working on in terms of this sort of uh, general multimodal representation of a patient's visit 
is we've started looking into multimodal question answering. Now, out of the three different uh, topics that you know, I've presented, this is definitely the most experimental. We're right now currently just in the uh, formulation phase of this. So if there's you know, any suggestions or feedback on this, it would be very helpful. Uh, basically, what we want to enable in the emergency department is a way for a physician to ask a high level uh, sort of reasoning question about a patient's data, uh, something that you know, probably involves using uh, multiple modalities of the data. Um, and we want the model to not only just return a response, but it also needs to return the reasoning behind the response. So as an example of this, one potential question would be whether a patient is stable for the floor. And in this case, the model shouldn't just return the answer. It should also uh, highlight you know, risk features such as the shock index. Uh, next slide, please. And so there's a couple initial methods that we're thinking about doing for approaching this problem. Both of them uh, revolve around using large language models. The uh, one that's on the left is sort of inspired by chat GPT. So basically here it's uh, text only for the prompt. Um, what we would do is we would essentially have a uh, textual uh, dump of the uh, continuously monitored data. We would also include the EHR data. And we would include the question. Um, that would you know, be what the prompt consists of. Now, the, the challenge here is that for large language models, they all have a maximum token length. For chat GPT, for instance, the max token length is 2048. We've also looked at some large language models that are you know, more specifically fine-tuned for the medical domain. Uh, some of those have token lengths of like 512. So there's no way we could fit a patient's full data um, in you know, a single sort of chunk here. Um, so the approach we would have to take is to chunk up the data um, or to use sliding windows and then to combine the sort of outputs on these chunks into a final response. Um, and so we think that that could lead to issues though if, for example, uh, the sort of information needed to answer the question is distributed across like multiple uh, of these chunks. Now, the second approach that we've sort of uh, talked about is inspired by OpenAI's GPT-4, which can actually handle multimodal data. Um, as input, it can take in both text and images. So what we would do here is um, we would sort of um, give it a picture of the continuously monitored vital signs, and then uh, the text would consist of the EHR data and of the question. Now, the issue here is, uh, in addition to the challenge I talked about for the text prompt, um, we also have concerns about whether the uh, language model would be able to uh, parse out granular information from these images. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide, please. Um, so, so that consists of the work that we're currently doing to make physio have a reality. Um, Really, uh, what would be helpful for us here is if people have, you know, any ideas for us. So these can uh, be of the form of uh, ideas for features you would like to see in PhysioHub, uh, suggestions for modeling approaches, or if you're working on anything similar um, that, you know, would be very relevant for us to know about, we'd, we'd love to hear it. Um, so thank you so much for letting us present today, and I'll open the floor for any remaining questions.